Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. Before we begin, um, I just want to alert you that you do definitely need an order of service in case there are any technical bumps along the way. It's really just to test your reading. So just have your bulletin close to hand. And if you see a discrepancy from the screen to the bulletin, trust the bulletin. Would you stand? Let me pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for this start of a new year in the church calendar. Thank you for this first Sunday of Advent. And we ask, Lord, that by your spirit, you would inspire our hearts to prepare ourselves, to remember how you came into the world and how you promised to return. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for opening hymn. Mary, 
raise us to thy glorious throne. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. some captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear Rejoice Rejoice Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel. Let us pray as we light this candle to remind us to be alert and to watch for his return. Loving God, we thank you for the hope you give us. Help us prepare our hearts for the Lord's coming. Bless our worship. Help us live holy and righteous lives. We ask this in the name of the one born in Bethlehem, Jesus. Amen. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Together we pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Sing that again, you give life.
Pause just for a moment. And in, and in the quiet, offer to the Lord all that's in our hearts, having sung those words. We adore you, we worship you, we give you our praise as we prepare our hearts for this Advent, we remember that you looked onto the world with all that was happening, the life, the death, the good news, the bad news, the violence, the attempts at peace, and you wrote yourself into our story, being born in weakness, in humility, as a babe. And so now, Lord, we, we lay bare our hearts our weaknesses, the darkness in our own hearts, we offer it to you as we continue in worship. Would you sit or kneel as we confess our sins together before the Lord? Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. So let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, who God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, sober life 
to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Now, mighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Do be seated for our readings, and youth, you're excused to your classes. Today's lesson is from Zechariah. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. On that day, there shall be no light, cold, or frost. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time, there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the righteousness of his cause, for God himself is judge. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The gospel of the Lord. Lord, as we stand, we ask that you would come and give us insight into your word that we might live inspired in our daily lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, do take a seat. A 
Welcome to St. Bart's. If you're visiting, my name is Dave. I'm one of the clergy here. And as you may have noticed, we are just having a spot of technical difficulty. So really, uh, the best thing to do is follow along in the bulletin. Uh, I'd encourage you to follow along in the passages just to make sure that I stick to the text and don't err in any grievous way. But we find ourselves in the season of Advent, which is one of these odd moments in the life of the church calendar when the church seems out of sync with the world or the church is taking up a prophetic posture to speak truth, hope, and light into a world where darkness is growing. And that, that is the theme of Advent, one of preparation, one of anticipation where we prepare our hearts for the return of King Jesus by remembering his first return, knowing that the next return will not be like his first arrival. And our passages this morning really hit on this theme of light and darkness. And so consider the, uh, the language here in these two passages. And um, really what we have is a type of language that has to be treated a certain way. And this is the language of teenagers. It's apocalyptic, which means that it's addressing a near event with long, cosmic, epic language. And if you have teenagers, that's the battle of getting out of the house the first thing in the morning. Oh, I hate my life. No, you just hate getting up early in the morning. But, you know, oh, it's terrible. No, you just haven't had breakfast. And, le and, and so a real definition of apocalyptic language is that it's a way of writing to describe big, dramatic events. And in the scriptures, it's usually about how God will stop, step in and fix everything. Apocalyptic language is not meant to be taken literally. It is a near cousin to poetic literature. But it is a way of dealing with uh, short-term events and wrapping in long-term eschatological truth. That's long-term truth about who Jesus says he is. So with that in mind, we're going to dive into Zechariah and Luke. Zechariah was written about 520 B.C., and, he is, and the, event, the, the occasion of his prophecies are to encourage uh, people who've returned from exile and who are having... Uh, to rebuild the temple. And he talks about the future day of the Lord. There are people who've been downtrodden, who've been, who are desperate for encouragement and who are on the verge of becoming full and rich with apathy. And so he talks about the future day of the Lord in, in Zechariah 14, and he talks about how God will intervene decisively and it's apocalyptic imagery, talking about something that's about to happen but will happen in the long-term scope of things. And it's talking about the cosmic implications of Jesus. The Mount of Olives, interestingly enough, features prominently in this passage. So that when we come to Luke 21, where is Jesus? He's on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus, using apocalyptic language, dramatic imagery of cosmic proportions using a similar device. Days before the crucifixion on the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple blends near-term events with long-term plans that he has for what he will do. And one of the great things we see here is the use of light and darkness. We sang about it. We light a candle. That's as pyrotechnical as we go. I suggested a Roman candle, but, um, you know, yeah, it didn't go very far. Um, Zechariah and Luke demonstrate God's movement that has been from the beginning of progressing and moving his people from darkness, which symbolizes chaos, fear, and judgmentalism or condemnation, to a place of light, to a place of order. And in the order, there is beauty. And in that beauty, there is redemption. And in that redemption, there is hope. 
And this contrast between light and dark is a recurring theme throughout salvation history. And so if you look down um, uh, to your text in Luke 21, verses 25 to 26, you see that Jesus talks quite powerfully about there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. The sea, for the people of Israel, was never a safe place to be because large bodies of water always represented chaos. 26, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. Well, we've been talking about this for a year. We've been seeing different iterations of people fainting with fear and foreboding for what's going to happen. And in this moment, what we have is the promise of Jesus bringing light into those places. And that light looks like order, looks like redemption, looks like hope. And Zechariah begins it in verse 2, which isn't in your, your, your readings, but he talks about half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off. A very dark things are happening in the world today, but all is not lost. In both passages, the initial darkness of condemnation reflects the chaos of sin and rebellion. The darkness, though, is at the end. God's light of redemption shines through to offer hope. And so let me ask you my first question for the morning. What hope do we, do you have to offer the people you will see this week? The second thing we see are these cosmic signs, this language of earth and moon and stars trembling. Uh, Zechariah puts it this way. On that day there shall be no light. And this cosmic language is reflecting the struggle between light and darkness. And think about this in Zechariah verses 6 to 7. Look down because I'm not making it up. You got to, with apocalyptic language, you never know. This could turn into something else real quick if we're not careful. Um, but verses uh, four, um, 14, verses 6 and 7. On that day, there'll be no light. Let me read the right verse, first of all. On that day, there'll be no light, cold, or frost. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but as evening time, there shall be light. What's going to happen, Zechariah is saying, is going to be so dark, people will think that it's the end. But it's not. Because though the day might be dark, light will come in the evening. And then Luke picks it up with Jesus' teaching. He talks about in verses 25 to 27 again, there'll be signs in sun and moon and stars. And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So there will be distress. And there is distress today across a number of regions of the world. But the reminder is here is that Jesus is not going to return the same way that he arrived in the world. He arrived in humility, in poverty, in order to identify with us. But when he returns, as the suffering servant and as the judge of glory, he is going to come in such a way that the whole world will stop and take note. Here's the thing. To a Jewish audience, this is a good day. This is not a day for us to fear. It's a day where he will, as the good judge, make every wrong right. And it's a day we have nothing to fear. The disturbances symbolize the conflict between light and darkness. And in Zechariah, light triumphs shining with a shining event at evening time. And in Luke, the coming of the Son of Man heralds the victory of God's light over darkness. His light over fear. Light over chaos. Where, here's my second question to you. Just for a moment, think of your lives, not what's playing out in the life of our community or our nation or the world, but just your own life, your own family. Where is the darkness of fear and chaos encroaching? Where do you need to see the light 
of Christ shine brightly. Because God's light brings life to darkness. And we see this with a mixing of a metaphor here in Zechariah 14, 8. Living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. Powerful, given that they're next to the Dead Sea where nothing lives. But here is the promise that has been brought up from the beginning of living waters flowing out, not from the temple, that was Ezekiel, but this is flowing out from the city that has been rebuilt, that had been devastated by the darkness. And then Luke, Jesus says, straighten up. Raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That was the refrain of Jesus in his ministry. The kingdom has drawn near to you. My way of doing things has drawn near to you. And so light in scripture often brings life just as living water, if you take a deep dive into it, represents vitality and restoration. And so when you come up to receive communion, it's just, you know, uh, the moms here will know this, you're an easy target. If you're expecting, you will know that I have probably prayed for you, asking the Holy Spirit to fill you with all vitality and strength for the days and weeks to come. That is the promise of the Spirit. And there are moments when we need vitality. And what is vitality? Vitality is strength, energy, um, ability to move decisively in action. And vitality is the fruit of hope. So where do you need hope today? What would this week look like just for you and your life and those around you if you were to be filled with vitality instead of the foreboding of darkness that comes in? In both passages, God's presence dispels darkness, bringing renewal, hope, and salvation to his people. So what would vitality and restoration look like today for you? And then lastly, divine light overcomes earthly darkness. The Lord, verse 3, what an arresting way to start our passage this morning from Zechariah. The Lord will go out and fight for you. The Lord will go out and take decisive, immediate action and intervention on your behalf. And then the most bizarre thing imagery comes, the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Well, when did God split something in two that was impassable? The executives, the uh, executives, the exodus, when he parted the seas. And then when they crossed into the promised land, he parts the river Jordan. And so there's another parting here, but this is a parting of the high places. And it's a sign back to the prophecies of Isaiah that there will a day will come when he will bring the high places low and the low places up. And a highway of the Lord will be built. And it's a similar type of imagery, but it's the splitting of a mountain as a sign of the light of God being able to transform the landscape of our lives. Again, it's not literal. So that there hasn't been some kind of meteorological or cosmic event where an asteroid has hit the Mount of Olives, splitting it. You know, if that happens, <laughs> I'm lost for words. This is not literal. This is figurative, this poetic language. And Luke picks it up by saying, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So the Mount of Olives, the splitting of it, and the glorious return of the Son of Man symbolize again the shattering of darkness. And so we have great, great cause for hope today, despite what we see. There is great hope because we have someone in our lives who has given us his light and that his light shines as a beacon of hope, declaring the defeat of evil. And so where might you be seeking God's intervention today? In a relationship? 
in a work situation, in the life of a, of a loved one who's ill? Where? Remember, this season is the season of Advent, a season of preparation and anticipation. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to do three things. One may be harder than the other two. The first is, and this for some of you will be the hardest, is to open up your heart to hope. What would it look like for you to entertain hope in your heart? Not in a fatalistic kind of way, oh, I hope it works out, but in a way that Jesus taught, in a New Testament way. I know that for many here, there are big things in our hearts, and I'll just speak for myself. On any given day, the darkness in my heart involves a certain level of pain, uncertainty, disappointment, conflict. And the challenge for me and the challenge for you is that with all of what is in your heart at any given moment, we're invited by Jesus to open our hearts up to the hope that only he can bring by his spirit. And that hope is the birthplace of vitality and restoration. The ability, vitality and restoration bring us the promise of a full life so that we're not just getting through the day, we're not just in survival mode, but we begin to live. And some of us need to come out of that survival mode. And, but we can't do it on our own. That's why we do things in community. That's why um, after this, I'm t in the youth space, I'm just going to teach a, a very practical 45 minutes on how to pray. And I'm doing it for the next three Sundays. We're going to look at three basic prayer tools. And then tonight we're going to meet here at the church for an Advent wreath party. And we're going to have not quite a ton, just shy of a ton of barbecue, plenty of drink, fire, and we're going to make wreaths. Why? Because together as a church, we need to come together and do things together to mark the changing of seasons. And this is a different season. This is Advent. It's one of preparation. And it's as we do things together that the vitality of the Spirit comes into our lives where we begin to grow into the fullness of life. We discover a new type of energy, a new type of strength because New Testament hope is a joy-filled expectation that good will come. Be why? Because God is good. That's just what he's like. He brings light into the darkness to dispel it. The second thing, and you may remember this in the early days of GPS navigation before smartphones, you can get a Garmin GPS device, and for a, a small fee, you could download the voice of John Cleese, and he would guide you on your directions. And if you took a wrong turn, he would begin to berate you in Monty Python style. And then if you kept going wrong, it just got up and up and up, and you felt like an abject failure if you took a wrong turn. Absolutely hilarious for the first 30 seconds. Then it starts to sink in. I was like, oh, I gotta turn this voice off. We're invited every week, but especially in Advent, as a way of preparation to repent of sin. Repentance just means to change a direction. And unlike John Cleese on my Garmin device, I wish I still had it, I'd play it for you. It would, it would scar you, I'm sure. Because um, the British tone makes it worse, you know? It's like, anyway, I'm married to a Brit, I'll stop. Um, but there's no berating from God. There's no I told you so. There's no, didn't I say that this was happen if you didn't listen to me? There's none of that. Instead, the scriptures tell us that repentance means to turn around a new direction. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, that we turn away from darkness by confessing sin and seeking God's kindness. It's about clearing the way for his light to come into our hearts. Difficult to do on your own. But if you have something weighing you down, confess it to a friend. Or make an appointment to come and speak to Chris or to me. 
Thirdly, so the first is open your heart to hope, repent of sin. Number three, be a light to others. Reflect the light of Jesus in acts of love, service, and generosity. It doesn't have to be a Billy Graham deal. That was a stumbling block for me. Oh, I could never do that. But some can. But for the ordinary people like you and me, what often works more powerfully or just as powerfully is a word of encouragement and or a listening ear. So many today feel unseen and unheard. And if we are ready to give of our time, which is so costly, and to stop and just say something, or to say, hey, tell me more about that, we find actually that the impact is remarkable. So there we are, apocalyptic language, all getting us ready to prepare our hearts and anticipate the return of Christ as we consider the steps towards Christmas. Why don't we stand? Let me pray. And Lord, as we stand and as we pray, I lift you those of us in our midst who need your intervention, for whom the darkness is very real, who need light. We ask that you would come in power and that your light would shine in the darkness. As John writes, that light has shone in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. For those of us who need help opening our hearts to your hope, help. For those of us, Lord, needing to turn away from darkness, come and, and lead us in that. And would you, as we pray every Sunday at the end of the service, lead us to bring your light into the world. And so we ask, Lord, that you'd give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Take your bulletins, will you, and let's affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share with one another a sign of God's peace.
It's a chess move. Good morning, good morning. Do take a seat. Good morning. Well done. If you're needing to flag down a child, just feel free to do so with exuberance. Um, they will find you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our service this morning. Just a couple of announcements before uh, we carry on with our service, all of which are in your bulletin. And just a note, we are aware that the, um, the slides from time to time are um, just a little disorientated, so follow the, follow the bulletin and that, that will guide you perfectly. It's a small little technical thing we're dealing with. <coughs> Here's what's going on uh, this week to draw your attention to you. The first is tonight. That's right, tonight, later this evening, we have our uh, Advent wreath party, which uh, will this year host uh, barbecue, drinks, fire, wreath. We're turning it into a bit of a party, so, uh, well, we need you to make it a party. So you have the details there. Do come and join us, five o'clock, all are welcome. Uh, and then immediately following this service for the next three Sundays, I'm doing a short, um, a very practical, hands-on, a class on how to pray in Advent. We're gonna learn how to pray on our own, pray with others and pray for others. Immediately following this in the youth space, come and join us. Love to have you with us. All right, this week we're looking at uh, how to have a quiet time and how to pray the examine. So if that's of interest to you, come. If not, enjoy uh, the rest of your day. And then on uh, next Sunday is our Festival of Lessons and Carols. Our choir, you probably hear them you know, if you're uh, next to someone who sounds amazing, it's probably because they're rehearsing with the choir for the Festival of Lessons and Carols. That's why I love seeing in front of Esther. Uh, it, it's great. And if you want to hear more, just come to the front. Uh, all these seats you can hear, it's great. And uh, more teachers about that are here. You've got the details here about the For the Nations Christmas store outreach. The deadline is next Sunday. And then uh, we have our details about the Christmas Eve service. And then last but not least, um, uh, as we are in December, typically as part of our uh, financial year, we, tend, we expect to bring in, as is normal for any church, 20 to 25% of our operating budget. So we just encourage you to be prayerful in this month. Our target, I believe, uh, to quote Chris, who has a better memory for these things, who's not here, um, um, we're looking to bring in about $160,000. And uh, that's kind of the number we've had for the last few years, so do keep that mindful. It's never been easier for you to give us your money. We take all forms of payment except for Bitcoin, um, and the details are in your bulletin. And in a moment, we're gonna come uh, to the Lord's table for Holy Communion. <laughs> all are welcome to receive, regardless of your denomination. Uh, as you come forward, place your hands like this. There'll be stations here at the front. We will take the bread, dip it in the wine, and place it in your hands. If for whatever reason you like a gluten-free option, place your hands like this, and we'll give you the gluten-free option. If you don't want to receive, we'd encourage you to come forward, place your hands like this. We'll pray God's blessing on you. And um, also, we have prayer teams available uh, who would count as a real honor to pray with you after you've received communion. You'll find them at the front and some at the back, especially on some of the themes we've hit on this morning. If you find it would be helpful, they'd count as a real honor to pray with you. As we come to the Lord's table, can I encourage you to humble yourselves under the hand of Almighty God, and He will lift you up, to cast all your burdens unto Him, for He cares for you.
Before we begin this Advent, we are blessed to have the bread that we'll be using for communion to have been baked and prepared by different families in the church. So we give thanks to God for this chance to worship His name and for the Larson family who prepared this bread. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is a right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in Him of everlasting life, that when He shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who have forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy.
and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. When we'd fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of us all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. And on the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, even now. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you well up within us? Would you come upon us? Would you make your light shine in the darkness of our hearts that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Beloved of God, these are the gifts of God given for you, the people of God. Take the remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Here I am to bow down Here 
That's our heart, that's our prayer, that you would make all things new, that you would be at work in us and through us, redeeming and restoring 
and pouring out your spirit that we might live this week with vitality and strength. All to your glory. Amen. Amen. Do be seated just for a moment uh, as we come to the birthday prayer. Any birthday boys or girls? To... Oh, right. We got a few. Let's go. That's it. Fantastic. Here we are. Any others? All right. Marin, how old are you going to be? Six? Ah, amazing. All right. I won't ask the others. Um, 50? 50. Wow. You offered. Ah. No comment. Let's stretch out a hand of blessing. Let's pray God's blessing over them. Watch over thy children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them where they stand. Comfort them when discouraged and sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passes all understanding, abide all the days of their lives. For Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Round of applause. Well done. <laughs> Would you join me in standing? Let's pray our prayer for mission of the world this week. Together, Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say, amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day, this week, and forevermore, amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. and serve the Lord.